Mark O'Connell and Robin Weigert. Welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I have to say I am a fan of, of your show, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you and Robin. Okay, well, it's a real pleasure for me. And of course, you wrote a very winning um, note to me, letting me know that you were a fan and that you would like to be a guest. And your note was so winning. I get a fair number of those. They, they're not all winners, but you were a winner. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, and, and I feel like a winner to have you, too, on the show, I can tell you. And um, so, uh, it, you know, I'm wondering how you two met. You're both actors, I know that, but how, how did you meet? You, you just platformed how we met really well, because Mark wrote a very winning note to me. <laughs> um, and I also don't usually respond to, you know, the, those things. But yeah. I, he, he, he was so... He so intrigued me because he was in the middle of writing a book called The Performing Art of Psychotherapy and uh, had responded to a character I was playing at the time, a psychotherapist on a show called Big Little Lies. And, yeah. and, he, and we started a dialogue as he was writing this book about, I guess, the intersection of um, the two, the, our two professions. And actually, Mark used to be an actor, so he knew a great deal coming in as well. And we had a great deal to say to each other as it turned out. My father was a psychoanalyst and um, I always wished for my dad that uh, he had been able to see what he did as a creative art. Um, I, uh -huh. I thought that would be something that would be um, psychologically beneficial for him. Let's just say. Yeah. If, he yeah. <laughs> if he could understand that what he did was um, gloriously creative, um, th the creative act, um, that is acting and the creative act that is um, being a psychotherapist share in common the art of listening. And so that was a lot of what uh, Mark and I uh, started to talk about is, is this, this extraordinary thing of, of listening and, and yeah. being able to place the other person in a, in a truthful space through your listening. And then, and then you as an actor also bring yourself into a truthful space through your listening. So, so uh it was a really fruitful and wonderful conversation. And, and I'm so glad that he wrote such a wonderful note. You yeah, know, he did. He writer. did. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and, and uh, your input, I think, uh, certainly appears in, in the book. And the book is so wonderfully written. Uh, so you both have experience as actors. And, uh, and Mark, you're, you're a psychotherapist. Uh, Robin, you're not. But I'm wondering, were you ever on the receiving end of psychotherapy? I assume yes. that Mark was in his training. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, I mean, so that probably helped in the role that you played uh, in Big Little Lies, which I'm a big fan of of uh, Big Little Lies, and uh, went back to rewatch some of the scenes that you were in there, and I recommend that to, to all of our listeners and viewers out there. Um, so... Mark, in your book, you, you write about what's been called a third uh, in the psychoanalytic literature. And I want to jump right into the deep end of the pool here by sharing with you two my sense of a third that I feel is already with us, namely synchronicity. I don't normally do these shows thematically, you know, uh, a, a series of shows on a theme. But as I look back, I'm struck by this show seems thematically related to the two that came before it. Maybe it's just me, but it, it, later you can take a look and see what you think. Um, uh, they both involved uh, a dive into narrative and story. Um, so, Mark, am I stretching the concept of a third too far to bring in synchronicity? Oh, not at all. Absolutely. Um, I, I, In fact... Um, actually, uh, Robin um, uh, recognized when I was when I sent her a bit of my uh, introduction originally. She recognized that I was writing about Jessica Benjamin, and I was trying to do it in a way that was accessible to really anyone. And and she recognized that I hadn't used her concept of the third. And we started talking about the third. Um, and uh, I recognized that there was a third kind of space opening up between Robin and I as well. Sure, yes. Um, and that's when I got really um, excited about sort of 
I'll bet. Talking with her and dialoguing and collaborating because the thing itself that I was trying to write about was happening in the way that we were communicating. Yeah. Um, including, and, and when you talk about synchronicity, I, I was even aware at that time, um, Robin uses the word invitation a lot with, with your scene partner. And I was thinking a lot about how when you're inviting uh, a kind of recognition between people, it actually, who knows how to explain it, but something enters that's bigger than both of you. And it's yeah. almost mystical. And I, I was having that yeah. experience uh, when I was talking with Robin, including learning about her grandmother, who was also a, a psychoanalyst, a formidable psychoanalyst. Um, and I started reading her and she's Edith Weiger. She's incredibly contemporary, actually, if you, it feels fresh. The, the writing she calls yeah. psychotherapy and art um, in her writing and talks about the need for the therapist to be flexible, the way an actor needs to be flexible and really join the person who's in front of you. So it's not at all a stretch to, to think of the third as, um, you know, in terms of synchronicity and, and, and all the possibilities for connection. Yeah. Yeah, and when these interviews go really well, sometimes I have that sense as well, you know, that um, there's a real connection that somehow goes beyond screens, and, and that's always a wonderful experience. Well, Robin's already given a, a good introduction, I think, to your book, Mark, which, which by the way, I, I think is, is fabulous, very well written and constructed, uh, very well argued. Uh, you can fit, you, uh, in the book, you convincingly uh, argue that uh, therapy can be seen as a performance. So uh, let me invite you to hit some of the highlights of that concept. Yes, and I think that can sound a little um, deceptive. I, um, I, I don't mean when I use that word at all that that it sh that it should be fake or that it, it there is fakery in it. In um, I, it's the opposite. I'm actually talking right. about real acting, which is we all, I think we all actually know intuitively that good acting is truthfulness, that the person is finding different perspectives and contexts in, in themselves. And that's when we respond to good acting. And so that's how I think of good therapy is um, when uh, the roles that I'm being cast in as uh, for this individual who's in front of me, um, finding those, uh, rather than trying to disavow something that feels uncomfortable or foreign to me, really leaning into it and recognizing, okay, for one thing, this is someone from this person's past or a, a kind of role that they're used to in their life, but it's also a part of me. It may be a part of me I don't like, but uh, it's human and, and it's necessary to lean into it to understand this person better. Um, and so uh, relational psychotherapists in particular would talk about that in terms of transference and counter transference. But I, I think before we even get to theory, much like acting, before you get to theory and technique, you're, you're working, you're thinking about leading with yourself mm -hmm. and your individual idiosyncratic being that you bring into the room. And that is where you start. And, and the goal is very simple. You're trying to make a specific human being um, be as alive as possible. And, um, and the means to achieve that goal are the same in therapy and in acting, which is at least two people need to exchange attention. That's it. Yeah. And that's where it starts. And that's where the magic you know, happens. Just to, I'm going to piggyback on that. Um, I did listen to the, I didn't listen to the one prior to that, but I listened to the one that, that aired, aired prior to this one, uh, when this one will, your last one. And uh, I'm very interested in that space, the difference between, or perhaps the overlap between what is being created and what is being unearthed. Um, mm. And, and there's actually, um, it's a, it's a grayer area than we might think. Um, so that, this business of character, when a character is being revealed or when a patient is being revealed, they're, they're also partly being created. And I suppose it's most obvious with a character that there is a creative act going on. But the way in which the patient, the analysis and whatever is being unearthed, it, uh, it is partly a creative act, a co-creative act. Um, uh, the story, which was last week's theme, um, that is attached to, that the patient begins to attach to him or herself, you know, it, it is, is part of how the self is constructed. And that story isn't a given. That story can be rewritten. That story can right. be examined yeah. and turned over. And yeah. so th this, is a, this is a huge area of overlap because um, what 
might not be intuitive to somebody who doesn't act is that a lot of what is happening when you're creating a character is that you're discovering the character. You have a set of discrete experiences. It affects your body and your you know, psyche, whatever, in, in certain ways. And the character begins to come out of you. And you, and you yeah. can simply observe, ah, there it is, as opposed <laughs> to, I sat down and manufactured that. Um, there, there is a synchronicity, to use your word, or a kind of a, a kismet <laughs> about yeah, yeah. that you, you, you begin to feel inhabited by the character, right? Okay. Yeah. Almost like like a, a ghost possession. You know, one of the things that really struck me in the book is uh, when you talk about. Uh, I, I'm going to say I'm going to say Mark. I don't know, <laughs> but you have so much influence on the book as well, Robin. So it probably it may apply equally. I don't know, but yeah. but but the section where you talk about uh, how to express this that. The actors, talking about drama now, the actors are persons with their own individual lives and characters and so on, and that effective actors, the, as, an, as a member of the audience, I'm not interested in them as people, and I'm totally sucked into this performance that they're doing. And I never thought about it that way. You know, before reading this, um, it really brought that home. That uh, and so, and, and you you talk about a sort of uh, going off script, which applies. I see how that applies in psychotherapy. That we can be too married to our to our theory of what we're supposed to do, rather than be fully in the moment. So I see that part. How in acting do you go off script? Well, if it's if it's not absolute improvisation of making up the lines. I mean, th this gets to something that's very near to my heart, which is the idea that there's a sort of sacerdotal function of the actor, which I think is is lost today um, a bit. You know, we think of actors as sort of yeah, performers are entertaining. We like them. They're celebrities. They're stars. But we miss the fact that what acting is for is that it's that it serves a societal purpose and that it has to do with empathy and it has to do with something um you know communicated through the actor being open to receive the character that then also opens the audience to their own potential um and it's it's an offering or it should be an an, an offering um a sort of gift of empathy uh and so i think that with with in that idea of what acting is it is for I like to um, leave a great deal of space for the unexpected to happen. I, 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 I like to leave a great deal of space to not know, uh, for not knowing exactly how I'm going to play a set of beats that stand before me. You know, I don't have a map necessarily. I want to be listening and I want to be receiving. And that's not just to what the other person is saying, but that's also what's to what's coming into me and through me. Um, and, um, you know, David Milch, who wrote Deadwood, um, talks about the trans transmigration of souls. You know, he, he really takes it to the next level in terms of, wow. uh, you know, what what may come into us. But I always want to be open for that possibility that something is just going to infuse me, that I have absolutely no, no say over it. And yeah. I just let it come through. Um, it doesn't always happen, but I want to make a space where that could happen. And that's nothing to do with going off script, mm -hmm. saying different words. It might, but it, it, it's much more to do with not having nailed down exactly how you want to do the yeah. same dance, mm -hmm. right? I, I would so, think maybe, maybe the tone of voice of the person mm -hmm. opposite mm -hmm. you might affect might your, your choice of the yeah. tone of voice of how, how you say your line. Yeah, I, so, so it's interesting because I'm speaking, I, I'm so used to speaking with actors about acting that it's, it's interesting to speak to someone who's a non-actor about acting. I'm because, very naive oh, about this. Well, no, no, yeah. I, I, I just hear you talking about uh, what we might call qualities, um, you know, and, and every acting teacher you have says, let's not talk about qualities, let's talk about intentions. Um, mm. You know, uh, people who don't act are going to be thinking like, wow, when she colored her voice that way, it really had thus and such an effect. If I were thinking, how am I going to color my voice so that I have this effect? 
it, it would be dead in the water. It's, it's what we're pursuing that's actually motoring the scenes, right? Mark, you can speak to this as well because you've been an actor. It's what we're pursuing. It's what we're, um, what we're sort of after, I guess you'd say, right? So mm -hmm. that's going to inform the tone of my voice as it does in real life. It's gonna, um, but if I sit around manufacturing tones of voice, you, uh, I might be in some trouble. I mean, there yeah. probably are performers who do that, but I think I'd be in some trouble in terms of you believing me. Yeah. Right, and you don't want to be seeking a yeah. result. I think that's what right, the right, right, right. have in yeah. common. Yeah. I mean, awareness, I talk a lot in the book about you want to have an awareness. You don't want to be self-conscious where you're trying to produce something vocally or in any other any other way, mm -hmm. but, but just an awareness of how this thing works and, and the different ways that you are, can use yourself in the present moment to, to reach, you know, the other person. And, um, and actually this is a really in, interesting subject for me in terms of um, just the idea of how you see the, the script that we have scripts as well in, in therapy, you know, a, a supervisor might tell us, Oh, just say this um, to the client. In fact, lots of the writing it, um, uh, it, uh, the interventions in the writing that, that say, you know, oh, I figured it out. And this is what I said. It's always about the script. It's not, we don't get to know <laughs> how it was delivered, which it makes a world of difference. You know, how you were, um, what you were feeling, how you were responding to the person in that moment, what the action was that you were playing and um, how you were using your body, where, you, where your energy was placed. Yeah, so you're talking about when we read a case history and yeah. it's just there on the page, but we don't know how it was embodied. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Keep and I wanted, the, I, so one of the things I wanted to do with the book is just make it a compliment to, you know, any kind of theory or modality any kind of writing on therapy. I just wanted it to, to compliment and really think about, well, how, how did you say the line? What actually happened moment to moment yeah. and holistically with your whole. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're saying in the book, you make a, a strong point of you don't have to throw away whatever theory you're married to, or you've been no, practicing, not, not at all. but, and, uh, and we all know that we're supposed to have presence I mean, we've heard this, we've, we've seen the research that it's the person of the psychotherapist more than anything else is going to be that person and how they're experienced by the client that, that will lead to whatever effectiveness there is there. Uh, and yet you give us a new way to, to think about presence and you break down a lot of the, by drawing on your acting experience, you break down a lot of the um, elements that might go into presence. Mm -hmm. I think I've, I have some experience. I'm not sure where or when or how of somebody who had acting training saying something to me, maybe it was in a skit or something in camp. I don't know, but it was like, <laughs> it was so, it was so powerful <laughs> That I kind of froze in the face of it, not having had that acting training. That was. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever had that well, experience? Yeah, I, I, I think I might know what you're talking about, but I also I am. Tr I try to be careful in the book to to say that I'm not trying to to offer you a way to be Judy Dench as a as a means of you know performing therapy better, at all. I'm, I offer all of those exercises: voice, body, energy. As a, as a means of staying present with this, like what, yeah. you know, your mind, your body, your context, your imagination, um, if, if those things help you um, to holistically, uh, you know, connect in the present, yeah. you know, because what you're really practicing is being present. And if those techniques are alienating someone, that's something you want to, you know, you don't want to do that. You want to, you know, so that's why I say you, uh, uh, I am encouraging therapists to think like actors because professional actors know that the main goal is to just, is to find the truth, find the connection. And then if the techniques help to facilitate that, great. And if they don't, and if they're deadening the whole experience, then okay, we're gonna try something else. But therapists don't necessarily think that way. And that's part of what I wanted to, to introduce is that, uh, or just uh, encourage more of um, is, uh, 
um, you, you know, whatever you're using, um, use it as a practice of staying present, um, really in your life and in your work. Which came first for you, Mark, uh, acting or, or therapy? Listening, which I think is just the same thing. <laughs> I, um, I really, the answer that I always give to people is it's just, it's just like, life's work and it began with just being a listener from a very early age and everything that that meant and, and um, mark, is a, mark is a wonderful parent i've had a chance to, you know getting to be his friend uh, in, in the wake of this to watch him with his uh child and um i think of good parenting as an act of listening the child into his or her own becoming you know yeah, there's yeah. there's a there's a course that the child is on and if you listen well you nurture them on that course. You're not telling the child who to be, or you're somehow violating the child. You know, you're you're trying to listen them into their own process of becoming. And I think that is also what you're doing for a character, and that's also what you're doing for a patient. So that's a real tie-in. You know, this creative act of listening. Yeah. Uh, and and my my grandmother's uh, collected book of essays was called "The Courage to Love," which I think is a wonderful title under which all these you know, essays were, were published. It, it's, uh, it's allowing there to be your practice and your, your, your methodology. And in the case of what Mark is also uh, helping us understand an awareness of how we come across all of that. Plus, you know, all of that in addition to making a space where something resembling love is possible to enter, to join in the, in this mm -hmm. kind of creative act that you're about. Um, mm -hmm. So that seemed critical to me yeah, um, yeah. I, I actually i watched uh mark i watched the uh youtube of the that you did for the psychotherapy networker in oh, which yeah. you disclosed that uh that you have a child and that i it, you sounded like you were pretty new to parenting at that point and you were very excited <laughs> yeah, very, about it very new. so so how old is, is it a boy girl what he's a he's a boy and uh -huh. he shares with with Robin, his name's Robin. Um, <laughs> Is there and, uh, a connection? Is, does Robin? Well, get synchronicity the, uh, again. Wow. Okay. He came about during this time I was working on the book, and it was just one of those another example of yeah. Yeah. The, but um, uh, he's a he's a, uh, he's going to be three. And oh, that's uh, a delightful age. Well, it is an age that um, that helps me uh, understand. Uh, not understand, but practice how to work with um, disappointed and um, enraged clients. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a, a very expressive child. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's also very, you know, it's three. So he's, he's, he's very sweet and very perceptive and, and then yeah. and very relational one moment. And then, you know, it turns on a dime, yeah. but it, it, it really helps me accept uh, my my kind of imperfect responses, um, uh, you know, to that kind of inconsolable sort of fury that a person yeah. can get, yeah. get into, and it really it really has helped me a great deal in the kind of improv improvisations with clients when you're trying to help set boundaries in a loving way, and there really isn't a way to do that without kind of going through the scene, moment to moment, being imperfect, apologizing a great yeah. deal. Um, so it's, it's helped me. I'll put a link to that video in the show notes. I encourage people to, uh, go ahead and, and watch that because it, uh, you really present a kind of case history there of, uh, of your learning in terms of, uh, learning how to deal with his emotionality and how to, how to handle your own, I guess. And it and and you and you bridge that to to psychotherapy as well, yeah. So I, I found that to be delightful. By the way, I'm a parent of of four now grown adults, two of whom were twins, and seven grandchildren. So I know what you're talking about. <laughs> you <really do. laughs> yeah, maybe not about acting so much, but uh, I always felt like I would be a good actor. Uh, it just it just didn't come about. Well, and doing um, podcasts, you're doing something akin to acting, aren't you? It's, it, it's, yeah, it's I crazy. think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I can own that. And uh, but talking to you two, I realize I'm really going to have to up my game in terms of expressiveness. I can sometimes just kind of be kind of flat. And I think, so, uh, so it's wonderful to have this opportunity to exercise that. 
So uh, what haven't we touched on yet? I'm sure there's a lot that we haven't really dived into here. Well, on the one Balkan. thing I, I want to uh, uh, address is that, um, uh, or or just emphasize is is that I really, I, first of all, I really want people to think when, when we're talking. I'm not introducing it in. Um, a new novel way to do therapy. It's not a new modality or technique or anything. It's not, an, you know, an EFT, CBT, LMNOP. It's not a new certification with letters. It is um, really what therapy has always been and what we actually do in the room. So I just want to emphasize that because I think a lot of us don't talk about what we actually do. What right. we're actually right. doing is, is using ourselves and figuring out um, what works best. Um, in this relationship, but, but somehow we don't necessarily talk about that. And, and when you, and so thinking like an actor, when you think that way, it just first and foremost gets you back to the core goal of the whole thing. That's what, during the pandemic, um, having to go virtual, um, having to, you know, <laughs> having patients hearing my son screaming in the other room, bizarre things happening, moving the computer to the basement, having to put on a Halloween costume because I was cold, like, you know, dealing with all the, all, all of the things going wrong, you, you remind yourself, I'm not, I'm not lost. I'm, the goal is to connect with this person and to use whatever I can to, with, to, to make them feel heard, recognized, and alive in this moment. Yeah. Um, and that's actually something, I have just been rereading um, a paper that Robin's grandmother wrote uh, on creativity, and she's talking about working in a time of crisis as well. She talks about uh, working um, at Nazi occupation in Berlin, and she talks mm -hmm. about one day of work where someone comes in who's a Nazi sympathizer, the next person is someone who's Jewish who has to escape, the next person is is Marxist and is, and is concerned about how she's going to be receiving this person. She's like, what technique am I supposed to be using? And yet, even in this moment of global existential crisis, she finds a way to connect with the people and provide the service um, what you know there's a way to provide the service even if the world is blowing up well really. I mean, you know uh, freud's civilization and its discontents you know it, it it's interesting that uh if civilization itself is it, is mad <laughs> um which then, seems to be the case <laughs> then it sort of it becomes an inverted equation doesn't it it's not necessarily uh, the good doctor isn't necessarily working to say how how do you get in lockstep with what society demands of you. It's mm -hmm. it's more how do you navigate a course where you, where you have a chance of selfhood um, in the face of all all of these pressures mm -hmm. um, and uh, and boy it, that that time in her life must have demanded so much empathy from from my my grandmother. Um, and it's, it's so counter to the stereotype, yeah. yeah. so counter to the stereotype that uh, is out out there about uh, psychoanalysts and psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. You know that that uh, it's it's not rote, it's not following a script, but it's really <laughs> being there and listening to that person. I'm going to cough. Excuse me. <coughs> That's the other thing I wanted wanted to address, actually, because with psychoanalysis, the, you know, the classic idea of a blank screen, as if that's right. possible, um, it, you know, uh, is is incredibly unhelpful. Continues continues to pervade the work of so mm -hmm. so many people when when um, when we're told to just give space to people. That's not something that you do with your absence. In fact, you can't be absent. You are there no matter what. So they're experiencing you, whatever you're doing. You you create space for, for someone. Even if you're perfectly still and silent, you create that with your presence. And that's the other main thing I always want to emphasize for people. Um, I do it in my, you know, my webinars. I, 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 we talk a lot about film performances, actors playing therapists, but really just how much is possible when you're just... Um, being quiet and actually actively listening to um, the person. Um, it, it, it's, it's an action and it's, and it's a practice to stay, to stay that present. And actually, 
no one is going to believe me, but one of my clients actually thanked me recently for and recognized that this person is a teacher and they recognized that I um, was present with them. Even when I he said, he, he was like in the beginning of, of the treatment, he was kind of like, I wanted more from you. I was kind of, I, I felt lost. I felt like something more should be happening. I was frustrated. He was like, but now I'm gradually appreciating that you're, you're there. And he used the word brave, even though I, I rarely speak in these sessions. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, it's certainly not anyone's idea of classic psychoanalysis. He, he understands that I'm, I'm there with him and, and, and values that. So I thought that was... Um, so I, I'm struck to hear you say that you rarely speak in session because... Uh, in the video that I saw, uh, you know, you're very expressive, kind of flamboyant, right? And uh, <laughs> I hope that's not too big a surprise. <laughs> um, and some, but but you're really, I guess, making space for them and putting that in the back. Yeah, and it de it really depends. That the practice is to be present more than anything, and so you give the scene what it needs. You give the person what they need and you figure that out as you go. Um, some clients, you, you recognize that you, you try, you think they want some advice or something and, or more of you talking. And then, then you, you see them flinching and you're like, okay, that's frustrating for them. And you learn to sit back and kind of follow their lead, which is, and that kind of adjustment is, I find really exciting when you figure out, actually, it's going to be really helpful for me to give more of myself or less of myself. Um, it's, it's really exciting because you are, being very genuine, but you're kind of playing a, a character too. And most exciting of all is you're pulling forth a version of this person that they're not comfortable um, inhabiting, but they need yeah. to inhabit. Yeah. So I want to comment here because um, one of the reasons that I got so engaged with Mark is he has so much joy. Um, <laughs> and you can hear that uh, in, the, in the way he's talking now. And, you know, psychotherapists, I grew up around a lot of them because my father was one, his grandmother, I mean, his mother was one. All his colleagues were around and about when I was growing up. And I noticed there were a lot of depressives, a lot of <laughs> depressed people yeah. who did not give themselves credit for much, actually. And my dad had taken over his mother's creativity series. And there was this series at the Washington Psychoanalytic Institute, which he was the president of, that where they would bring in creative luminaries from wherever, you know, Anais Nin traipsed through our house at one point when I was a child, <laughs> Gary Gygax who invented Dungeons and Dragons and who, whoever might be sort of interesting for them to study. What is it to be creative? And I always thought, even as a very young child, like there's something, there's a fallacy here, you know, that you are creative. My, my dad would listen to classical music and weep at the, at the uh, you know, Bach and Mozart and Beethoven you know, how did they do it? You know, what, yeah. and, 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 and they, and psychotherapists in general, it seemed to me then maybe different today, uh, seemed to fall into this sort of cloud of uh, I, my function is here in the shadows. And I, and I, um, I observe and I, you know, I help the, the, the other people to realize themselves and, and, and why I wanted to join in with Mark in his endeavor was, was to say, no, there, there can be tremendous creative joy in what you are doing. There can be, you know, it, it is an art form. Yes, you know, mm -hmm. like, like kind of wanting to do a clarion call to all the psychotherapists out there. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be so sad. <laughs> um, yeah. Really, yeah. It, it can be a joyful practice, even if you're seeing people in tremendous pain and trouble, you know, um, which is part of the deal. You know, mm -hmm. you, you are doing something phenomenally creative. Um, and I feel like Mark is a great example of that. So, oh, thank you. For saying I, I think I think maybe you guys are on the vanguard or some kind of a cutting edge, maybe, of helping to get this message across. And uh, I think back to when I was in graduate school in a, in a, you know in a psychoanalytically oriented at the University of Michigan program. And yeah, the faculty did look sad. I was alienated by it. I actually, I, I didn't find anybody that I was aspiring to be like them, which, which made it very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, it did feel like, you know, and reading it, books like by these uh, uh, <clears throat> Finischel and other very technically oriented psychoanalytic writers, you know, where it was all about technique, 
and nothing about heart, soul, joy, mm. creativity, etc. The, the only thing, yeah. huh? The That's only thing the that got it's all about it's about yeah, the human right. condition. It's so it's 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 um, really astounding to me that um, we kind of miss that. And 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 but the uh, the practice it's a practice of integrating the full self. And when you think in terms of an actor, I think that's part of what makes it fun for me. Um, because actors talk about, um, you know, act actors have so much more fun playing real life people, for example, than those people <laughs> had living their lives. You know, they talk about, <laughs> you know, Daniel Lewis will talk about the, you know, the joy of playing Lincoln or, you know, or Meryl Streep will talk about, uh, you know, Julia Child or whoever. And, 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 you know, the, or someone who's really difficult, let's say, and they'll say, oh, she was so, she's so difficult, but they have so much joy trying to understand her from the inside out. And we can do that with our clients and with ourselves. And ultimately, I hope to encourage my clients. I want my clients to be thinking of themselves the way an actor talks about a character in an interview where they're like, oh, she's going through a really tough time. She's, she was experiencing this trauma, but, but having this, this kind of maybe even like creative uh, energy exuberance um, as they piece together their own life, yeah. um, and it really is a con the actor. Actors make such a great contribution. Actors like Robin, in particular, make um, a contribution. The actors who um, get to play so many different kinds of of people and to embody so many different aspects of humanity. You know, it, it's, a, you, it's a contribution. Robin, you played so many roles. I was looking through the filmography on IMDb, and it was like shocking and then you know in uh in uh lies and uh i'm blocking on the name of <laughs> big yeah. little lies you know you're you're playing against or not or with or performing with you know these uh world-class actors um Reese Witherspoon and and uh, Meryl You're talking Street. about a, a, a listers, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So how these how do you not? Actors. Yeah. Did did you have any problem with it, feeling intimidated or you know did no, you have to work I mean, with yourself I, in any way to get I'm, I'm through that? I don't. I don't. I don't suffer from that. Um, I wow. you know I um, if anything I have a lot of empathy for the pressure that um it puts on an actor to be a, a celebrity of that stature it's 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 a very unnatural way to go through life you know uh you can't walk down the street without being stared at and it's it's um yeah. it's there there's there's a new uh, uh relatively new compared to the others uh disease in the dsm-5 called acquired situational narcissism um which w w w <laughs> if you look it up and yeah. it, it it is not uh, the narcissism that that comes from I imagine everybody in the world is looking at me and thinking about me. It's it's what it's what comes from actually experiencing that on a daily basis. Acquired situational narcissism. Yeah. It's very hard to um, to dodge when you are an A-list celebrity because <coughs> everybody's giving you a super unnatural level of attention, and I actually uh -huh. think it's sort of an affliction. Um, although the paycheck more than makes up for it because you can get a really good therapist. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, a top drawer therapist to uh, help you with that issue. But um, no, so I, I always see the pressure they're under, um, you know, when our, uh, when my, pa I, I have some, uh, you know, maybe some pay paycheck envy, um, you know, but I don't, <laughs> <laughs> won't deny that. But I, but I don't feel dwarfed by it. I feel if anything engaged by it, because I think it's, it's a hardship. Um, yeah. And, and more often than not, there's a wonderful, wonderful person in there, but needs to, yeah. to to trust you needs to feel trust to to um you know to open up and, and, and be able to be present and all they want to do is be present um uh, it's it's the same thing for all actors you know and if you're able to come in and give that person an excuse to be present you're really doing a service both to the piece and to you know yeah i'm thinking um, of britney spears a bit as you mm -hmm. uh, you know as you talk about this acquired narcissism and the oh. difficulty the difficulty i'm not, of, I'm not pointing that at anybody in particular <laughs> of yeah. her situation, you know, which yeah. really shines a, a spotlight on that as well as many others that could be mentioned. Mark, I'm wondering, um, in your training, was there more encouragement to be yourself, to be spontaneous, to uh, uh, be in touch with your joy? Uh, it, is it, Was a, a change in the 
philosophy reflected or have you just come to this on your own? Oh, no. There, in fact, it's going in the other direction, which I should note. I have friends who teach at the at, uh, social work schools and even the big social work schools are all behavioral, evidence-based. The insurance companies are basically ruling social work programs to take yes. a psychodynamic, yeah. not even psychoanalysis, psychodynamic course at a social work program now is, is like taking like something in the dark arts or something. Yeah. It's really, a, it's, it's a problem. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the long form in a person's history is, is like mystical or something. So um, no, uh, I, I, because I had gone to drama school and um, you know, and I had been to grad school twice. I was like, I, I, I really wanted to be very careful and independent in my, um, how I how I trained, and so I I really just gravitated to the writing of um, I chose my mentors based on the writing that I gravitated. So I chose people and not places, not institutions, and I think that really helped me have a very free sense of, of which of how to work. I think you know they're both apprentice professions, acting and and therapy. You really learn mm -hmm. from from people in that connection with mm -hmm. another person. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so, so yes, I did, I, I suppose, but I chose my training very independently. Yeah. What, what would you suggest to people who want to develop presence, uh, who may recognize in themselves, well, I'm, uh, I'm not, I don't know if I'm that good a listener. Actually, I went so far as to decide to get training as a glider pilot, because huh. I knew that my attention wanders, you know. And I thought, okay, I'm going to put myself in this life and death situation where if I don't pay close attention, you know, I'm not going to make it. Uh, what do you recommend? I wouldn't recommend becoming I, a glider pilot. I wouldn't pilot recommend anything better than that. I mean, that's that's, <laughs> that's incredible. Good for you. Um, yeah, and I mean, uh, really anything that's uh, going to put you, I'm, I'm quoting Brene Brown now, but, but really put you in the arena so that even when, like my client was observing about me, even when you're listening quietly, you want to have the sense that you are being observed, that everything that you're bringing, even by default, is having an effect. It's just a, it's a practice. So anything that's going to help you uh, practice um, recognizing yourself, even just on your own, I know this is a dicey thing, but but videotaping yourself or watching yourself, I tell people in my webinars to just take a look at yourself in while you're in session. And they think, well, I'm, I'm not gonna be listening to the client. And actually you might even be listening more deeply and ironically getting out of your way more if you know, if you get a sense of what this mask is that you're bringing and what you're yeah. doing automatically. Yeah. You might so, actually, yeah. So you're you're doing supervision in webinars? I do I do uh, workshops uh, based on the book, and I do um, I'm doing one tonight actually. I do uh, with a company called CEU, so you can get CE credit if you're a social worker, and then I do at conferences um, around the country. So I've, oh, I've been at the, yeah I've been at this networker symposium, and I hope to be back uh, this coming year. And at the IARP International Association of Relational uh, Psychoanalysts and Psychotherapists next year in LA, I'll be there too. Good. So you're bringing this uh, rather fresh voice uh, with with some energy into the field. That's good. What if people want to? Well, it doesn't sound like just any odd person. They're all connected to particular organizations. So you're not doing any sort of freestanding workshops. No, no, not. Uh, I not would really. I would encourage you to do that, uh, just uh, because I think that. Uh, this should be, you know, I've got lots of psychotherapists or, or wannabe psychotherapists who are listeners and viewers of this interview. And I, I would think they would feel a little spark, you know, about, wow, I would like to develop these kinds of, uh, this kind of confidence about having presence. Thank you. I'll think, I, I will think about it as part of my re-entry plan. Re <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to say something to you too. I, I, I'm very impressed that you tried to be a pilot to to, to work on presence. It's really so cool. But uh, <laughs> um, and you were both talking about Brene Brown. I I think part of presence is vulnerability. Uh, mm. And uh, this fake sort of tabula rasa idea of what a therapist is is, right. is part, one of the reason that one of the reasons that fails is there's just no vulnerability on the part of the therapist who's trying to be tabula rasa. It's, a, it's what some maddening partners do in relationships, which is say, <laughs> this is all about you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and you know you're being gaslit when that's going. Um, it's, it's, it's daring to be um, 
actually mm. present means daring to be vulnerable. You know, the, the patient is bringing a lot of difficult material in. It's no doubt triggering and there are counter transference and transference issues that are, that are going to come up and you have to brave those waters or you're, it's just, you're unable to do any good from a position of safety. Yeah. And, and I would understand why over years and years you want, I mean, you kind of proceed into a safer and safer posture almost naturally because it's, it's very, very hard to absorb um, so much darkness. Uh, it, it really is. But again, if, 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 um, if Mark has a significant contribution to make, I really think it is this, which is that if it's engaged with joy, um, it, it does not have to uh, wear you down to the point where you become ossified and shut down within mm. the therapeutic scenario. You know, you, you actually can engage with that sense of spark and joy, even even a patient in the most acute pain, you know, the most the mm -hmm. deepest crisis, someone who who clearly needs medication and is just bringing sorrow and misery into your office every single time, you you can engage it with this curiosity and this interest um, that has to do in a way with character. I think with with mm -hmm. let's mine this, let's see what this wants to become, let's get in there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't just have to be about fielding this this uh, pain and taking it on and taking it in if you're not protected from it, which is where you stop listening well, you know? Yeah. Like, and that, that's, yeah. it's, it's necessary. It's necessary to lean into it and to, and to use it. When I, my, in the chapter in my book on and, and practicing being present, that's one of the first things I talk about is loss. It's, 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 you know, I, I make loss a daily part of my practice. So the joy in, or the energy kind of, you know, comes out as a side effect of actually just practicing being in all of it for, for me in my case. But I think that for everyone, I mean, I think you, it's, it's by, it's by leaning into the pain and integrating it into your being, which is what actors do. Actors are always trying to cry and, and stuff like that. Actors are always talking, you know, you know, I remember being a young actor and being and like really forcing it. It took me now that I'm in my forties, I'm like, Oh, it's, it's there. The pain is just it's there. there. <laughs> it's available. Yeah. <laughs> um, but well, it, per particularly during this pandemic, maybe we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, <clears throat> plenty of pain, uh, <laughs> plenty of pain coming to the fore in the pandemic. Uh, how have you dealt with that? How does that inform therapy? Uh, again, I, I have, um, uh, <laughs> Try, just struggling and trying to take my own advice. I found it harder to take my advice on, on being present. I, re I realized it was really nice when I had, when you were able to have a babysitter and you're able to structure your life and everything was fine and, and I could go for my runs in the park with ease. That was easy to take my advice on how to stay present. I found it much more difficult, yeah. um, obviously, when you are, your husband's in his board meeting and you're exchanging the child. And, you know, all the things that everyone has been going through, but even still, it, it really um, has been uh, about loss and, and again, leaning into, okay, my body's different. I'm in pain in certain ways. Um, I, my mental health has taken a hit because I can't go for my, my run and I can't talk to as many people. Um, and I'm going to use that to help me under, to connect with each person. And I actually found it, uh, I, I felt very lucky to be a therapist um, this past year, uh, to be able to connect with so many different people and actually provide some space and to understand to a certain extent, yeah. firsthand what many people were struggling with and normalizing it because everyone was in their own little silo too. So that, so that was part of the function of, of my role. So, so having that role, I think helped me uh, to, to survive that myself and to help people. What, what what would you say to people who are suffering uh, during the pandemic? We thought that it was over. <clears throat> I know for myself, I've got serious questions about whether or not it's over or whether we're in for more of the same or even worse. Um, do yeah. some therapy on us. <laughs> 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 I mean, you ha yeah, again, like we have to be, um, you, you have to just try to center yourself in, in, in every moment. You don't want to play the end of the scene, as it were. You just have to be, you have to be where we are. And we're, we're not nearly out of, out, of, out of the woods on this. I mean, especially those of us with kids, you know, our kids aren't vaccinated or the but young kids are not. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, 
And who knows? What, if we learned anything, is that is that we can the, we can be blindsided in any moment. Like the rules kept changing with this. It was like a well, migraine. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I'm, the question wasn't directed to me, but I do have a strong thought on this, which is that one of the diseases of the culture is that it's been in denial of death. Um, you know, death is not an integrated concept at all in America. Um, mm. And we're, we're not able to escape it with this. And um, mm. all, all of the attendant opportunities for spiritual growth are there because we're forced to actually look it in the face. Um, you mm. know, this, this denial of death, this modality that we're all in, is, um, has, has not been helpful to any of us, I don't think. You know, it's, it's a it's a running from, it's a suppressing, it's a, uh, you know, let's just put the elderly away someplace where we don't have to look at them. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a very cruel culture in terms of healthcare and everything else because we do not grapple in any way with death. Um, and the pandemic uh, does not let us get away with that. And I see a lot of people going through these extraordinary life changes that sometimes it has to do with raising it all to the ground, you know, like I'm just going to take the entire structure of my life and completely get rid of everything and start building again from scratch. Mm. And, but what they're building is stronger, truer, better, more integrated, more who they actually are. And I see mm. this over and over and over again. So yes, there's tremendous loss. It's very confronting, but it also might be a path towards greater health as mm. a group as a collective, you know, than what we came from before. God knows, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so just to try to look for the opportunity in it is for, for me the, the silver lining of this terrible, painful, scary situation. You know? I, 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 I agree with that. I agree. I think I think I have found certainly with all of my clients and myself and um, more connected to, to self um, than before, even with um, uh, again, a lot, lots of painful changes. And um, actually, one there was a song that um, a folk singer that I love actually to uh, Suzy Roach and her daughter Lucy Wainwright Roach uh, mm -hmm. wrote a song called "Swan Duck Song," I think. And I share it with some of my clients. It's really it's about it's about what Robin's saying. It's about um, bodies changing, recognizing mortality, and um, and but the freedom. Um, even in, 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 the, in the great loss and pain, um, uh, the freedom that comes with that connection to self when you accept this is, this is me, this is, my, this is my body, this is who I am. Um, you know, I think that's a great wrap up maybe <laughs> for, uh, for our session here. And I really want to thank you both uh, for this opportunity. Uh, wonderful to meet you and very enlivening and thought provoking. And so uh, I thank you both for being my guest today on shrink wrap radio.